Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm Chase Cunningham, Dr. Chase Cunningham, if you want to be formal. Uh, we're going to have Heather Dahl and Mike Vesey up here as well from ID Ramp and Indicio. Uh, we're going to talk about verifiable credentials and the future of enterprise security. So there's a disclaimer, um, which everyone always reads every disclaimer you've ever been presented, so there you go. <clears throat> we're going to talk about zero trust first. Never trust, always verify. Uh, you've walked the floor, you've probably heard of the conversation around the Lockheed Martin kill chain. This has been around for quite a while. It's sort of referenced as almost like a biblical thing in cybersecurity, right? If you're looking at this from the context of Lockheed Martin, basically they look at what an adversary would need to continually be successful in the context of an exploitation life cycle. If you really kind of think about it, we've got a lot of victimology in cybersecurity. I personally hate the conversation when someone says the bad guy's only got to be right once. Yeah, the bad guy's only got to be right once to get in, but after that, if you choose to ignore their presence, then you're basically allowing them to continue the exploitation lifecycle. What does the bad guy need to be continually successful? They need accounts, they need access, they need escalation of privileges, they need usernames, they need bad passwords, they need privileges, exceptional conditions, et cetera, et cetera. So if we look at the life cycle of that and we think about verifiable credentials and we think about the way that we can take back the power, we can basically take back five of those seven things within the Lockheed Martin kill chain pretty quickly and the bad guy starts to lose. So we don't have to sit there with that victim mindset of, oh no, the bad guy's gonna get me because someone clicked the phishing link. Which by the way, I'll talk about phishing links in a second. It's not good for us to basically sit around and kind of wait for the adversaries to come after us. This is an attack scenario, cyber warfare is a very real thing. We are engaged in a digital battlefield. You either choose to engage the adversary where they're coming at you or you allow them in. Uh, if you're sitting at your house and someone shows up, you don't let the plumber move into your home and drink your beer. The plumber shows up, does their thing, fixes the stuff, and you send them on their way. This is the same sort of way that we're trying to get people to understand this, is not that the bad guy is only right once and always right. They have to continually be right, just like we do. If we can change the game, we start taking back the power position, and they'll go somewhere else. Unfortunately, in cybersecurity, it is not a zero-sum game. Uh, if we live on a street and you don't have security and I do when they rob your house, it sucks for you, but Chase didn't get robbed. So this is the way you should start thinking about this is basically not being the continual victim in the space and you can take back the power from the adversary. The perimeter does no longer exist. If you've been living under a rock for the last two or three years, we had this thing called COVID, everyone went remote. We basically obliterated the concept of the perimeter. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the fail of the first perimeter-based model of cybersecurity, it was the fall of Troy. All right, what happened to the fall of Troy? They had a big wall, they had something outside, people thought that was interesting and cool, they went and grabbed that thing, brought it in, bad guys dropped out of it, moved laterally, burned the city to the ground, you wind up with a crappy movie with Brad Pitt in it. I mean, that's really where we started, and we proved thousand years ago that the perimeter-based model of cybersecurity was not going to work, all that we did was digitize it, make it move at the speed of light, and let everybody have access to it all day, every day, and think we were gonna get it right. We've been wrong for about 30 years, and we have plenty of proof of that. If we continue to engage in a perimeter-based model of cybersecurity, we are literally choosing to engage in enabling, enabling failure practices. Period, point blank, end of story. Click, there we go. Perimeter-based security doesn't work because people are people. Uh, statistically speaking, and this was a study that was actually published, three to six percent of workers clicked on phishing links even after cybersecurity training. Anyone on that floor that says they've never clicked a phishing link is an absolute liar. I will tell you unequivocally, I have clicked phishing links. I have a doctorate in computer science and cybersecurity. I preach the gospel all day long. People get phished. Personally, I'm not a fan of trying to make people not click links. Humans are humans. If I glue someone's hands to the table, they'll click a phishing link with their nose. It's just gonna happen. Statistically speaking, three to 6% doesn't sound that bad. What if you have 100,000 employees? That's a lot of access. Hackers ransomed Ireland's entire public health system because of one person's bad click. What, was it really the click that caused the compromise? It was the click that opened the door, but what had to happen for this to go on for 207 days? I've been a red teamer, I work for the National Security Agency, it's not because you got in once that the game is over. You know, you always see in the movies where they, where they do the hacker voice and they pull their hoodie up and they say, I'm in. Like, great, but that's not where it stops. 
They have to continually have access. They have to be able to move around systems, lateral movement, all those things. All that stuff you see on the floor over there with those 3,117 vendors has to be enabled for the bad guy to continually win. It may start with a phishing link. It probably starts with a phishing link. But you've got to continue to allow that to occur for it to continue to go on. The 207 days mark, that's essentially 207 days of failure of ignoring the problem. You probably had indicators. <clears throat> COVID killed the perimeter. We're no longer there. Basically, the statistics tell us that we're not all going to return back to the workforce unless you work for Oracle or Apple. I'm sorry. Sucks for you. You're going to have to go back to work. Larry Ellison said, I built a bunch of really nice buildings. you got to be here five days a week. Apple said, we built a spaceship. you got to be here five days a week. The rest of us can kind of choose to go back and forth. 26% of the global workforce will never return to the office five days a week. 70% increase in the use of remote connectivity. Does anybody here not work at least one or two days from home right now? Most of us work. Really? That sucks, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's, it's that good? The money's that good? You're willing to go in? All right. Hey, good for you. 76% increase in, uh, in the remote connectivity uh, in BYOD. Most of us now don't want corporate machines. Um, honestly, you shouldn't have to get a corporate machine. If anything, you should be able to live off of a Chromebook in most, most situations. Unless you're doing super amazing, crazy developer stuff and you need an Intel Pentium X processor with all the cool stuff on it, we can typically live off of cloud resources and we can use Chromebooks and those types of things, Microsoft Surface or whatever. We can live in that BYOD space. But again, if we don't change the way that we practice security to deal with the reality of where we're going, this digital transformation stuff, we are choosing to enable continued failure. Old practices don't work well in future endeavors. So when we think about ZT, th people think that it's a super crazy, heavily complicated, amazing strategy. A lot of the vendors out there, I won't say names, are basically telling you if you buy us, you get ZT. I don't know what the hell that is. But in reality, there's three basic tenets. If you boil away all the stuff, all the marketing schlep, it's basically three things. And this is not saying that this is all encompassing, but if you're thinking about ZT, credentials, access management, the basics, it's this. Verify explicitly, always enabling least privilege access, and assume breach. Everything is breached until proven otherwise, and then guess what? It's proven breached again. Sessions are not your friend. You do what you need to do, and then you're kicked out. There's no longer access, access, access. Uh, if you're using VPNs, VPNs are really only good for the bad guy. VPNs allow you to go from a point in space to somewhere in a network because you pump through a door. There's no policy engine on the side of that. You can't do things like least privilege access, and you can't assume breach. And zero trust is an industry-sized movement. It's gone from just a bunch of folks talking in rooms. When I was at Forrester, we were basically putting together the framework for what ZT would look like. That framework has now been adopted by the DOD. If you look at it, the DOD's seven pillars are exactly the same seven pillars that we published at Forrester. There's a giant growth in this. 78% uh, of organizations globally are talking about moving to ZT. The good thing about a real strategy is a real strategy is, in, is only for you. The way that you practice zero trust will be different than the way someone else practices zero trust. Just like your physical health will be different from someone else's physical health, but you'll still be healthy. There are basic tenets that you can put in place, but the way that you do it will be different than someone else. The DOD just recently allocated another $750 million to move to zero trust for all agencies. They have a zero trust program office that's sitting on top of about $2 billion that they're putting in place between now and 2027. And that's all of DOD. So if you're looking for a giant, monolithic, bureaucratic organization that's super slow that you could say we can do better than them, point to the DOD. 13% of major financials, a lot of healthcare folks are doing it. And basically, if you ask folks that are security leaders, they'll agree, they may not say it out loud, but they'll agree that the old model has categorically failed. The total addressable market for this is, I think the last numbers I saw actually are bigger than that, it's about $56 billion globally. So that's why you see all those vendors out there marketing how they enable zero trust, because there's a lot of blood in the water, and the sharks are circling, and they want to go after those dollars. Now, how does, digital, how does the digitally distributed ecosystem fit into zero trust? Well, the things that you want to do to start taking back power from the adversary integrate really well. I run nodes on the Indicio network, because I think the Indicio network is doing cool stuff to enable this approach for organizations. 
You do things like enable authenticity. It's scalable. We always need effective scale. Most of this stuff should be open sourced if it's done correctly so that people can build and develop it themselves so that they can put it in place. There's no reason, really, that you should have to have a massive budget to enable zero trust. As a matter of fact, I would say you can build an entire zero trust ecosystem completely open source if you have the resources and are willing to suffer through the stuff that happens with GitHub when you try and deploy open stuff software, but you can do it. Compliance is gonna be part of that. It's gotta be easy to integrate and it's gotta enter that sort of cycle of always being secure, always doing things like enabling those three tenants I talked about. Distributed digital ecosystem allows you to do those things while also enabling privacy. And if we do this correctly, we're looking at where the future goes because this is where identity goes. Identity, all of us, our identities are going to be the mechanisms that power ZT because what do bad guys compromise to gain access to systems to continually cause failure? It's not a firewall, it's a user, it's a login, it's a password. This is where we're gonna go, this is what it looks like in the future. And click, there we go. Are you good to go? Hi. Thanks Chase, in fact, um, when we talk about ZT, oftentimes organizations will talk about their ZT architecture, there are solutions that they're buying, and it goes back to when we were working on this early framework, if you never trust and you always verify, the question I have in this is, great, what are you verifying against? A centralized compromised database? A compromised federated identity provider? <laughs> so when you use ZT and you're looking at the decentralization, ZT also applies to identity. And if you don't have a clear identity answer to your ZT position, you only have a one-handed handshake. And that's the uh, part I'm going to talk about today, is the other hand of your ZT handshake. What is a verifiable credential? A verifiable credential, think about it almost as a type of container. It is encrypted. It is used with, to, to be transported between the participants in an ecosystem using an encrypted, what we call a DID communications channel or DIDCOM. A verifiable credential is tamper-proof. It can be, it basically contains authoritative data that is passed within the ecosystem. Um, verifiable credentials make trusted information portable. Verifiable credentials are not a rip and replace of your existing systems. In fact, the decentralized identity technology are agents that sit on top of existing systems because what is great is if you assume there is no perimeter, you don't need one actually to exchange this data in a trusted digital ecosystem. What allows an issuer to provide that credential to a holder, and then the holder is the one that directly transmits the information to the verifying organization, is the verifier doesn't actually have to connect to the issuer directly. It removes complete need for direct integrations, which reduces complexity, reduces attack surface, means you spend fewer hours in your general counsel's office. It makes things move quicker. And so rather than checking with the source of the data in order to verify it, it's actually using a blockchain ledger to support that, which removes any sense of correlation. You're saying, well, verifiable credentials, decentralized identity, this is something I'm starting to hear about, I have been hearing about, I see a lot of slide decks like the one you're presenting me today, but is it real? And when we think about identity, oftentimes the most high stakes identity that we think about in our personal lives is crossing a border. And I've been working on decentralized identity for a very, very long time. And for much of the years there, I only imagined that one day I would legally cross a border using a verifiable credential on blockchain. And do you know what I did last month? I legally crossed a border using a verifiable credential as my passport, 
my passport actually never left my bag. And I legally crossed a border in an existing immigration system using decentralized identity technology. How did that happen? It's because I was able to take my passport with a digital wallet app and create a verifiable credential that met the ICAO specification of a digital travel credential type one. So those in the travel industry and airlines will appreciate that. And from my kitchen is where I created my verifiable credential. And I shared that credential using a DIDCOM channel directly with the government of Aruba. You can feel bad for me that I had to go to Aruba to do this. But the government of Aruba received my passport from my kitchen directly from me, and I did not have to go to the third party. I did not have to transport. I did not have to have a third party involved in any of this. It was me straight to the government of Aruba, and they were able to ingest my digital travel credential. And you know what? They responded back to me with a trusted traveler credential saying, guess what? You just crossed the border. And then I used that for check-in with my airline. And when I landed, the biometrics and facial recognition that I provided directly to Aruba was what I used to clear the e-gate. And my passport got to ride in my purse the entire way. No more opening, first page scan. You know the drill. If we're at a point where we are legally crossing borders in existing immigration systems and the trust is there, this technology is moving forward and we already see it in play in financial services for KYC, for account information. We see it being used for professional athletes to share medical records with teams and partners. So this technology is moving forward, but what it does is either A, it is saving organizations costs, creating efficiencies, allowing airports to envision a future where arrival halls are full of duty-free and anti ands but it's also allowing each of us to have the consent and control over our data. So when you look at a traditional data transfer, what are you facing here? You're facing API calls, you're facing costs. In today's macroeconomic climate, the invoices from federated identity providers are not looking so great. You're looking at boards who don't want to spend more on security. You're trying to reduce complexity because maybe your teams don't have as many employees. And then you're trying to just stay away from general counsel's office as much as you can because there's a massive amount of paperwork. Here's what verifiable credentials do. It allows you to share verifiable authoritative data directly from the issuer with no direct federated identity integrations here. It simplifies the consent because at every step of the way, there is a machine readable government governance that is overlaid here that the so-called owner or holder of that information that has been given is one that applies consent. And it allows, here's the key, it allows for offline sharing of the data as well and verification, which is very important for many use cases. And so what I'm going to do is turn it over to Mike with IDRAMP. And IDRAMP is one of the pioneers of implementing decentralized identity into the enterprise and workplace. And so I hand it to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Heather. Yeah, um, oh, thank you. So that's great. We heard we heard a lot of reasons from Chase about why um, you know zero trust was really important. Heather laid out um, a better way, right? A better approach. What I'm going to talk about today is how we're going to put all this together. Because immediately after presentations like this, um, everyone looks and says, "Man, this sounds really hard, right?" I can't imagine how we get from where we are today to to this place we want to be. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And, um, and see how we can, how we can evolve your, uh, your identity and, and service delivery infrastructure to be able to accept this, um, uh, this solution um, and be a little more agile and, and, and adaptive. So first, let's, let's step back and take kind of a macro view of identity and where we're at in the industry. And this, this quote came from, um, from Gartner, and I think it's really, really surreal. I mean, there's a lot of uh, power in this, right? We're, uh, Gartner is saying in, in, by 2024, there's going to be digital identity standards that we're all going to have to conform to from, from our governments um, and, and other sources. 
And it's really interesting. So, I mean, just a quick show of hands. How many of you think this is a good idea? All right, any CISOs in the room? Okay, I mean, it's a, it's a thorn, right? I mean, the CISO is looking at this pessimistically going, okay, here's one more thing that's going to be thrown at me as soon as next year, and I have to figure out how to secure my environments to, to these things that constantly change. So very, inter um, very interesting um, uh, note. Next thing, a little more of that, um, you know, more statistics. This is overwhelming, right? A typical enterprise has 60% uh, of those organizations have users with over 21 disparate identities that they have to try and uh, to uh, manage in accessing their systems. They're working across multiple clouds. They have hundreds of applications, and they're just trying to figure out how to stay afloat, let alone be dynamic with how to adapt to these changing technologies. So, how do we adapt the technologies that Heather was talking about and the principles that Chase was defining, and how do we get those into practice? Well, the solution is orchestration. Now, when I was preparing for this, I went back and listened to a podcast that I did in, in 2019 because there was something in there that I remembered talking about, and I actually called this a fabric at that time. And really interesting because now we're starting to see orchestration turn into kind of this fabric message. So you'll hear that a lot, I'm sure, in the next year or two about what an identity fabric is and how it can help. And, you know, we look at um, orchestration as basically a, a flexible integration fabric that allows organizations to seamlessly connect and manage digital assets. So um, all of this, of course, is done to improve the agility and, and the ease of, of implementing new services and, and crossing clouds. <clears throat> So let's dig a little bit deeper into the orchestration message. What is it? So it's important that any decentralized solution or orchestration solution supports decentralization. Um, we need to be able to plug and play new things, multi-factor uh, applications. It needs to work, work across any vendor, any cloud, as I mentioned, um, and, and allow the application of new technologies, most important thing, zero code. We have to be able to do this without armies of developers because I love developers, but they take a long time to get these things turned out. By the time they finish one integration, we got three others queued up. Um, let's go one layer deeper. So we actually have to have the ability, and this, this term came on the scene from uh, Kupiger Cole. I think Gartner has been, um, has been known to, to talk a little bit about composable enterprise. Composable enterprise is really nothing more than what we just talked about, right? It's taking pieces and parts and assembling them in, in such a way that we can deliver better value and better velocity and better agility. So we need to be able to plug and play with traditional infrastructure. We need flexible authentication flows for distinct user experiences. Really important one on this, we also need to be able to, need to, be able to normalize user experience flows across legacy applications and new applications. One thing we see in the enterprise a lot is Enterprises are working across two or three different clouds. They're delivering hundreds of applications, and their user experience is different for every single application because they're working across all these different things. Normalizing that either requires massive amounts of federation, which again is time consuming, costly, um, and you're always dealing with stale information, um, or, or it requires them to use something in the middle to kind of to orchestrate these flows, right? So we see a lot of value in being able to do that. Taking new technologies and new solutions, right? Maybe we want to allow our two or three different identity sources, but we also want to take a look at a truly decentralized, verifiable credential type solution. How do we do that? Do we start with a forklift, you know, and replace everything that we have? That doesn't make any sense. But if we incorporate that into the fabric, now we can selectively and surgically take a certain application and say, for this particular application and this particular set of my users, I'm going to allow them to authenticate using this type of technology, this type of approach. And that will lead to a better, you know, a better solution, obviously, long term, that they can hopefully retrofit a bunch of the other existing applications. Um, has to be easy to implement new services. Biometrics, proofing, things like that are all coming. Uh, organizations are inundated with these types of requests, and they really don't have a great plan for how they're going to, uh, to adapt. But if they have a lightweight, flexible type of system to, to implement and integrate and deploy these things, uh, life gets a lot simpler. 
Um, last point, easy to add verification, any number of services, any type of IDP, that's pretty much what we just talked about. So cross-cloud is something that we should all be thinking of right now. It's coming, uh, it's coming fast and organizations are trying to deal with whether it's through M&A or just natural business evolution, uh, how to deal with multiple different identity silos. All right, so I want to I want to talk a little bit about just how to get started, uh, and then I'm going to wrap up and leave plenty of time for questions. So, um, how do you get started and apply this in your organization? Well, some of this will be a repeat. Most important thing is to find the use case and, and define an MVP. Pick the technologies you want to use, and the most important thing, deploy them somewhere that's lightweight and agile, so that you can implement your or integrate into your existing production workflows without having to rip and replace. Um, you could deploy the, uh, uh, those con small and surgical configurations into production services. And um, obviously the, the schedules and things will scale depending on the applications and number of users. That's more of a point just about the fabric itself and how they need to adapt. Um, lift and shift I talked about, explore other digital transformation use cases. So basically once you get this in place and you've got the new technologies um, uh, deployed to a few use case and, and test subjects, you're then able to go back and make a long-term plan, right? And the fact that you don't have to do this wholesale shift makes it very, uh, makes it very easy for you to make a longer-term plan on how to adapt these new technologies and stay, stay flexible. Um, I think that is all I have, and I would love to open it up to questions. If anybody has any questions, please walk up to the microphones provided here, and um, we will we'll take those as a panel. I have to confess I probably missed something. <clears throat> so I understand the idea of a verifiable cr credential. You make it tamper evident so that it, you can tell if the data that the credential is conveying has been somehow changed or altered. But how, do you, how does a presenter of a verifiable credential prove that the credential is theirs to present? So not tampering with the credential, but tampering with the person electively to make it look like they're the person who should be presenting this credential. Feel free, I can, I can take a run at it if you want me to. So you're asking as you present a credential to me, how do I validate that it is yours to give? Is right, that what you're if saying? you envision one of the many times in Mission Impossible when Tom Cruise is put on someone else's face and voice, right? How do you prove that the person behind that pretending to be the emir of some place, right. isn't actually. Right, so Heather, and you jump in, but you mentioned machine-readable machine readable governance, right, is a huge part of this, and it comes down to governance in that, in that scenario. The issuer of that credential will be somebody that I trust, right, because I know who has issued you that credential, and so uh, I have ways of, of telling that that is a trusted. If it's, for example, a, a, a state-issued credential, um, I know that that's been trusted uh, due to the, the, you know, the governance that I have in place. You can probably do a lot right. more eloquent job of speaking right. to that. In so order to obtain that credential in the first place, how do you prove that I should be the rightful owner of that? The and rightful presenter. Presenter of that information. Um, and the, the first part is there are multiple layers, everything from secrets to information that only you know to liveness checks to presenting additional credentials. So you can continue to layer it. For instance, when travelers were obtaining medical records um, through a program that involved the New York Health Information Exchange, they had to not only provide some of their information, but they also had to provide it information that probably they knew about what facility they took the test in. They had to provide a sacred information about another provider that they see. So you can continue to layer on what it takes for the confidence. In order to share and present that information to a verifier, it's in your digital wallet in the first place. So how do you access the wallet? Facial recognition, fingerprint, pen, providing on the, when you're presenting it to the verifier, providing additional credentials that you would have access to. So it just depends on the layer of confidence that you need. In the case of the passport, it was um, opening up the digital wallet with my biometrics and a pen. 
And then in order to receive the credential, part of the process that I went through was a liveness selfie check as well. So you can continue to layer those until you're the rightful owner. Um, the goal here is that you eventually work towards the edge cases of oftentimes we'll get the question, what if someone you know, takes my thumbprint? And you're probably in a more challenging situation. But the goal is to get the majority of the credentials confidently to the verifier. And they have confidence not only in the individual or holder presenting it, but they also have confidence in the verif in the issuer who gave it to you. And, and I will concede that most of what you're talking about with the issuance and, mm -hmm. the, and the provisioning and the transmission can all be secured. But it's that last little point, right? Who gave you the $100 bill? I don't know, it's a $100 bill. Um, and I think it kind of gets to that point. Who gave you the passport? Well, I would presume it was the person who owned the passport. But there's not necessarily, I don't think that there's the level of authenticity built into the exchange. There's not as much authenticity built into the exchange as there is in the construct of making the verifiable credential. We can do a really good job of making the verifiable credential, but we're doing less of a good job in being able to get the authenticity of the presenter, which is really, I think, the use case that we have to go right. for. Right, so in that, the, the goal of the verification organization is what are you going to require to feel confident? You can layer on existing, live as selfie, you can add say, I need additional credentials from you, I need additional information from you, just like the issuer needed to Pre give you the credential to present, a verifier can request that of you as well before they're willing to accept it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I, excuse me, I had a single question, not five follow-ups. Um, it's a question about the ecosystem of decentralized identity, barriers to adoption or incentives for adoption. Specifically, it, it seems like decentralized identity is an ecosystem with governments, businesses, and individuals all playing their part. Who will be resisting, who will be incented, who will be wanting to drive this forward? Where are the barriers? Where are the first successes other than Aruba going to happen? Uh, the barriers right now, education. We're just learning about this technology, trying to understand how to implement it with our existing systems. So right now, that's the first barrier. When it comes to barriers and the technology working together for an ecosystem, it often comes down to working together on interoperability. In this, there are seven layers of interoperability. It is utilizing the same open standards. It is utilizing um, the open source code bases together. And so you're creating solutions with an open core. When it comes to, um, I'll say, non-technical reasons of barriers, is one of those is actually working in favor. And that is regulations and laws around privacy and how data is shared. And in the US, we're, I believe, in a unique position compared to the rest of the world. We don't face the regulations they do around privacy and user consent. And because of that, it's actually driving organizations to seek these type of technology stacks in order to meet regulation. In the US, I'll still get the, no one cares about their privacy, OK. But do you think regulations around privacy, around data management, around consent are actually going to reduce and go away? No. They're going to continue to evolve. And how do we as enterprises, as companies, even the public sector in the US play with the rest of the world? And so I believe that these drivers and the rest of the world on legislation is going to actually propel it forward and not necessarily serve as the barrier. Yep, and I think a big driver is just going to be the usability, right? The user flow that Heather went through getting into Aruba, who doesn't want to use that, you know? In, in our company, uh, all of our passwords are eliminated now. We use verifiable credentials to log into Slack and Zoom and all of our different services that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and the minute you, you do that and you use it one time, 
the next time you go somewhere and have to look up your password, it's like, oh, man. So that's going to be the driver, I think, is going to be ease of use, usability, when people and organizations realize, I can ask for verification for something that I didn't have to go to the trouble of, of issuing, then it's transformational. I can focus on doing my job better as opposed to managing user data. And, and I think that's going to be a big driver. I have a question. It's more like add-on, maybe, on the topic of almost like sub separate discussion. But uh, let's say when we look at in our bank, we actually kind of work on this topic, and we don't find authentication that difficult. Where we are facing challenges, authorization management, with this kind of really distributed identities and so on, actually. And how do you manage that? How do you do that? on the fly, in a way. Right. We really didn't have that, we haven't found the solution yet, so maybe you have some ideas. Right, decentralized identity governance. Check out DIFF Decentralized Identity Foundation and their DGov project. But um, th this has been something that's been transitioning and evolving in the space for 10 years. <laughs> and there was a time thinking when we needed a, a trust registry, which was adding a centralized mechanism to a decentralized ecosystem controlled with a gate. So that didn't work out so well. Um, really where it comes down to from a technical point of view is uh, machine readable files that are provided to the verifier, to the issuer, and they can set their own criteria on what they're going to accept and they can edit those files on the fly. So they don't have to rely on a third party to provide the governance. They can determine the governance within the systems. And everything involved with what I outlined is at the DGov project. But for governments, when we think back to once upon a time in the pandemic, science was changing by the hour. And governments that were involved in verifying COVID information for travel oftentimes needed to change by the hour. Technically, how were they doing that with some of the third party systems, they were having to call that system and say, you need to change this and wait for them to do the change. What attracted public sector to this technology was, you mean I can make my own decisions and change it every other minute if I want to, and I don't have to rely on a third party verifier? Yes. And so using a decentralized approach to the governance on a technical level, and then having the policy overlay on that is what we see driving these systems forward. Oftentimes, just from how do I get going so we don't boil the ocean, oftentimes they're starting with their close partners that they already have contractual relationships with. They understand the business already, and then they're overlaying that existing policy into the decentralized identity governance that is in the machine-readable files. And, and Heather, let me add, I've got a little different lens on that from an application perspective. Think about authorizations. We did a, we did a project with, with NIST a few years ago and we were talking about authorizations. So as an application developer, if I write an application that defers those authorization requests to a credential that I know every user has and ask for information contained within that to make my authorization and, and, uh, and privileged access decisions. That can work across my entire application stack. How do we do that today? Well, we go into Salesforce and we create this policy and we sign these people to this policy and then we go into our other workday and we create all these policies and we add these people. So we're repeating that for every single application that we're trying to protect our authorization management. If instead the application just defers back and says, just go ask this credential and the user can present it, we have one policy, right, that transcends all of our application stack. This is where I believe applications are going to get to, and, and that will be disruptive and transformative, and then we have to get uh, decentralization as a part of that, I think. Sir? Hi. Yeah, just a quick question. Do you think Microsoft's introduction of Entra is going to assist in uh, proliferating this a bit? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, the decentralized identity management from Microsoft Entra, is that going to expand it to the ecosystem? Is it going to? Yes, yes. Um, uh, Microsoft has been involved in the communities. Um, I believe, you know, they're working with others who are providing similar type of solutions. It helps to bring this technology to the forefront. 
Um, they're also driving work on governance as well. And so I think, yes, it, the Microsoft Entra is a win for this space and adoption. Yeah, I agree. I, I, it, can't, it, it cannot hurt to have uh, someone that controls as many uh, identities and desktops as Microsoft to be thinking about decentralization uh, as a core strategy. So right. it, it's, going to, it's going to help our cause tremendously. tremendously. In, in addition to that, Google Cloud has moved decentralized identity technologies into the marketplace recently. And so I think that also helps facilitate enterprises looking to adopt this technology. which maybe we maybe questioned out. So we want to thank you um, for joining us here on this last day afternoon. We're around to take questions, or you can find us on the usual socials. So thank you, everyone.